Good afternoon. All right. Um, I really am delighted to be here. This is my first trip to Buffalo, and I'm really disappointed. I was told that there would at least be 12 inches of snow, <laughs> um, and, and uh, Dean Lee was gracious enough to, uh, to give me credit for the good weather that has come in, but I had to admit that, in truth, it's raining in Oregon. So uh, you, you get all the credit for the good weather on your own. The goals for the next hour. Um, I would like to define some themes that I think are changing the way that education is operating in the United States. And I'm going to suggest that there are three big changes that are happening that regardless of whether you're interested in behavior support, math, reading, uh, family intervention systems, whatever, it should be something that you would pay attention to. Second is I'm going to argue that in the great rush to focus on defining practices that work. I mean, what are the instructional practices that help little kids learn uh, math and reading? We all too often miss the strategies that it takes to actually get it put in, to get those interventions put in place. And there's a field developing called implementation science. And I want you to be thinking as the work that you are doing is focusing on building strategies, how you actually put it in place. I'm going to speak primarily from my experience implementing school-wide positive behavior support. So of those of you who are here, how many of you actually had experience with PBIS? 86.3%. That's good. All right. So um, there are a couple of places where I may ask you to join in when we have the choral parts of PBIS. But uh, generally, I'm going to go through that fairly quickly. And in part, I want to come back to what does this all actually mean for those of you in New York? So as uh, Dean Lee said, I'd like to take about an hour and do that. Five o'clock, we'll take a break and uh, have any questions, discussions, issues that you've got. And then we can get together afterwards during the reception. Make sense? All right, so here we go. Um, you are already thinking, right? Each of you, just as I did the introduction, were saying, now, what are the three themes, right? So here's what I'm going to argue. I would like to suggest that education in the United States is being transformed from a, a system that has been identified as being less effective and less efficient than we wanted to one that's going to better match what the uh, nation is requiring, in part based on three big areas of focus. The first, which is the theme of, <coughs> this, uh, of the Dean's lecture series, is the emphasis on evidence-based practice. In part, far too often in education, and anyone who has been an educator knows, that there has been this real focus on local control. You basically do whatever you thought was the best thing to do. Essentially, part of what's happening throughout the country is we're being asked to focus now on let's define and implement things that actually have demonstrated evidence that they're effective at producing change. Now, all of that is great, but as my 92-year-old um, mother indicated at, um, at Thanksgiving when I said we were focusing on evidence-based practice, she was pouring the tea and she said, well, that's sweet, dear, but does anybody implement anything else? So. Everybody thinks what they do is evidence-based. The real trick is, how do you produce that? The second big change that I think is happening is this notion about building multi-tiered systems. So those of you who are familiar with PBIS, you recognize the triangle, right? Already you feel a little more comfortable, relaxed. You now know things are going to be OK. <laughs> but the, the, the real issue I want to argue is this notion that any educational inter intervention, a math, a reading, science, behavior, any intervention that's put in place should be put in place with the capacity to be implemented with multiple tiers of intensity. So if you do literacy, what's, what's the primary tier for literacy? What do you add for those kids who need a little bit more? What do you add for those kids who need a lot more? If you're working on teaching writing or you're teaching self-regulation, you're teaching social-emotional learning. What's the foundation? What do you do with kids who need a little bit more? And what do you do with kids who need a lot more? Basically, no strategy, intervention, or program in education should be implemented anytime next without being able to demonstrate not that it has one trick, but it comes with multiple tiers of intensity. 
The third thing that I think is shaping what we're doing is this whole notion on, imp on implementation science. We know more about what good education looks like than we implement. And the gap is too large. It's too large in part because we have not been systematic, we have not been careful, we haven't paid attention to what it takes to actually put things in place. So if you think about some of the messages from implementation science, and most of this comes to us from the work of Dean Fixon and Karen Blasey, who are now at the University of North Carolina. Part of what they say, and, and I, want you, I want to focus on this just for a little bit because I want you to come back to your own reflections. We know, for example, that if you want to put programs in place, you have staff training. And uh, I cannot tell you the number of behavior management staff training workshops that I was sent to when I was a teacher. And every time I got sent away and I would go and I would do the training and I would come back with a three ring glossy binder. And my job was to inoculate the rest of the staff. And essentially, that never worked very well. So here's part of what implementation science suggests. Those of you who are involved in professional development, basically the message goes like this. We all do training. Training is good. There's nothing wrong with training. But training is insufficient. If the goal is to establish the capacity of a faculty to implement a practice, one, think about the way in which people are selected. Do you actually hire people based on their skills related to the practice? Think about the extent to which coaching of the newly trained skill occurs. Dean Fixon and Karen Blasey essentially argue that whatever your training budget is, if you don't have at least 25% of that also allocated to coaching, essentially the things that you train are going to go away. And the number of examples that we can all think of where we went forward, we had training, people came back and nothing happened is too much. So think about not only the selection and coaching, but also one of the things that people would look for is they would say, to what extent do we have performance assessment? Don't train and coach people unless they are also going to be under conditions where they get feedback on how they're doing. For teachers, for uh, teaching assistants, for administrators. So within education, part of what the implementation science arena focuses on is they give us much more to pay attention to than we typically have done. Now we've tried to listen and use that in the development of this framework called school-wide positive behavior interventions and supports. And one of the key things I want you to pay attention to is getting access to the cookies at reception is going to depend on your ability to say what is school-wide positive behavior interventions and supports. All right, so here this is this is the key to being able to get access to the to the reception goodies, and in part PBIS is a is a multi-tiered framework. It's not a curriculum. It's not a clear specific set, and it's designed to actually alter the quality of the social culture in the school so that it creates an environment in which all kids benefit both behaviorally and academically. So it's really organized around creating more effective learning environment. But the key features of at least tier one PBIS focus on this. If you think about schools and you think about the extent to which problem behavior interferes with good education, we want to talk about creating schools in which the social culture actually adapts and supports good teaching, good learning. So think about if you were, um, I was going to ask how many of you were sent to the office one or more time, but that, don't do that, all right? I want you to be thinking about the extent to which disruptive behavior, angry behavior, even um, tardy and skipping behavior affected your experience as a student. Part of what we know is that we can actually change that. We can make schools much more inclusive and much more effective learning environments. And the things that we've learned, one, focus on prevention rather than on consequences for inappropriate behavior. If you focus on prevention first, it's more effective, it's more efficient, and it is far more consistent with the pedagogy of creating a learning environment. Second, if you're gonna create schools that are really effective environments, walking into the school, you should be able to say, 
what are the behavioral expectations? Actually define what does this look like? Be respectful, be responsible, be kind, whatever, whatever they are. Do the students actually know what they are, what they mean, and how to do it? Build systems where appropriate behavior is consistently, rhythmically, and regularly acknowledged. Now, this doesn't mean you have to give people Corvettes for saying nice things, but it really does mean you want to create something where appropriate behavior is not ignored or expected. It is actually acknowledged and appreciated. And you can do this in ways that are incredibly efficient and also fit the developmental level of the students. It is okay to have consequences. I mean, one of the things I worry about when I talk about positive behavior support is that everybody's gonna think that it's just sort of getting together, having a group hug, and hoping that people do well, right? And in fact, what I really want you to have come away with is there are clear consequences. The difference is the old way of thinking about consequences was if somebody did something bad, you took a hammer and made it stop, right? You used punishment to try and decrease behavior. Here's essentially what we learned. I want you to use consequences that are not punishers. Instead, use them as instructional tools. That is not an example of being respectful. This is what it would actually look like. Practice doing it the right way. Use instructional, use, use consequences that prevent the student's problem behavior from interrupting everybody else's work. Use instructional consequences that do not deliver inadvertent reinforcers for problem behavior. So if you use instructional consequences effectively, you can actually create an environment that is much more likely to decrease problem behaviors and increase appropriate behaviors. The collection and use of data, a continuum, the multi-tiered system, and implementation of systems and well, as well as just teaching specific skills, build the social culture. So here's what I'm looking for. Think about the schools that you walk into. When you walk into a school, I want you to say, to what extent do the kids have a common language? If you were to walk up and say, what are the expectations? Do they know what it means? And it's not just the really well-off privileged kids, but do, can they tell you this is what the behavioral expectations are? But the second part is, do they actually know what it means? So what does it look like in the school? So if you were to ask someone, what are the behavioral expectations? And we're standing in the hallway, then you'd say, show me what that actually looks like, right here, right now, or what is being respectful in the classroom look like? What is being responsible in the cafeteria look like? But here's the real key. The third part about building a social culture is that everybody knows. So this is not social skills training for those kids who are in trouble. It's building a social culture in which everybody not only knows the expectations, but they know that everybody else knows the expectations. The goal really clearly is to create more effective and more equitable learning environments. Effective in the sense that everybody knows what the expectations are. Equitable in the sense that you deliver high quality education with a level of explicit support that makes it accessible for those kids at greatest risk. So one of the real keys of PBIS is to make high quality education available for a wider range of kids. Essentially, if you wanted to boil it all down, right? So if you were to go back and you talk tonight to your spouse or spouse equivalent, and they say, what was this really all about? You say, this is really all about creating environments that are predictable, that are consistent, that are positive, and that are safe. People can actually understand that. If you create that kind of environment, you're gonna get learning outcomes that are far more effective. It's gonna change the way that schools work, it changes the way that classrooms work, it changes how individual students define themselves in the context of the school. And most importantly, I want you to build schools that work for the young woman who is not too happy about the ways that are working. It's okay to say you didn't get that problem right, but we're still gonna come back to focusing on the behavioral expectations. It's important to build schools that work for those kids who come with the disabilities that make things a little more difficult. It's important to come and build schools so that kids from a wider range of cultural and linguistic backgrounds are equally successful. I gotta tell you, I worry. I worry in part because I travel quite a bit. I go to a lot of schools, 
And I see too often one thing happening in the United States right now. People are looking and they're saying, our district has had less money than we've had before. We're, we're in a fiscal state of austerity. And so part of what happens is they say, you know, these are the kids with whom we can be successful. Let's draw a circle, come on. These are the kids with whom we can be successful. But, you know, I'm not sure we can be successful with Derek, and I'm, I'm not sure we can be successful with Elliot. And, you know, I don't think uh, Elaine is really somebody who fits well. And my goodness, Morris actually is a threat to himself and others. And we love these kids. We think they're very effective and they're very powerful. We want them to get a good education. Just we think we need to find a place that is appropriate for them, preferably very far from us. You've been there? Okay, here's what I want you to do. I want you to use and implement PBIS with high fidelity because it makes the circle wider. It makes the school an environment where the staff, the families, and the students all identify themselves as being more effective with a wider range of kids. And that's a critical variable because most of you have been in education long enough that you know schools only work if all three parts are invested. You've got to have students who understand who they are, how they are there, what they do, and what they contribute to the environment. You've got to have faculty, clearly, who are able to deliver, and you've got to have families that are supporting those students. And unless we have those three parts to an educational community, we're not going to create entities that work and work for everybody. All right, so school-wide positive behavior support is primarily a structure, a framework, that was largely built by a guy named George Sugai. George is a professor of special education at University of Connecticut, and he worked with us in Oregon for about 15 years before he was enticed to the East Coast. <clears throat> now, I know Buffalo is not the East Coast, but people in Oregon think of it as the East Coast. My wife's actually from New York City, and she thinks of Buffalo as the West, so, um, so I understand. But anyway, Connecticut is, is in between those. Part of, George had four big messages for us. Message number one is that the social culture of a school matters. Those of you who are really focused on math, reading, and writing scores, you will not achieve academic outcomes unless you create a behaviorally coherent environment. Second, and this is really the big one, all of us were taught as teachers to make our classrooms brilliant. Here's the big message I want you to take away. We will not implement high quality classroom intervention unless we do it at a whole school level. The unit of analysis is the school. The unit of impact is the student. But whole schools need to adopt math, reading, writing, science, and behavioral interventions. And that changes the way that things operate because it means the adults in the building need to operate in concert. George also taught us that it's really fun to do the, the short intervention pieces. I mean, I have, I've got to tell you, I've been doing behavior management, behavior support for a long time. And it's really fun to build the plans, put them in place, watch kids develop. I mean, the stuff about, you know, what do you do when she uses the F word? I mean, we love that stuff, all right? Basically, here's what I want you to do, and especially those of you who are young and just coming into the field, here's the reality. No longer do you just get to do the sexy stuff, all right? The sexy stuff is okay, but I want you to add the systems that will allow the sexy stuff to endure. Do not implement PBIS in a school unless you implement it with a plan for it to endure for a minimum of a decade. Do not implement a new program unless it's delivered with multiple tiers with the systems that will allow it to sustain for a minimum of a decade. That means the policy, the funding, the team, the data structure, the organizational scheduling, the stuff that nobody pays attention to except the administrators who are underpaid and overpunished, all right? So in part, that's part of what's critical about putting this in place. And the big message also is if you're really gonna do it so that it is implemented with equity, you need to implement it not just at one level, but with multiple tiers of intensity that meet the needs of the students. George taught us always to start first with what the outcomes are, math, reading, language, social-emotional development, self-regulation. 
make sure that those outcomes are culturally and socially equitable, that they are part of the community. Then build the practices. The practices are what actually produce change in student behavior. Make the practices fit for elementary, middle, high school. Make them fit developmentally, make them fit linguistically and socially. The systems are what are critical for adult behavior. And you've got to endure. You will not build, implement, and sustain a practice in schools unless the, the adults in the schools actually believe that it fits how they operate, what they do, and what they're trying to accomplish. So building the system so it has cultural fit, it has contextual fit, is critical. And one of the things that we strongly advocate, only, only those who are most arrogant implement something without data. The rest of us always know we're going to get it wrong in the beginning, and we need data to continually get better. So part of what we've learned, PBIS has a set of core features, but we don't implement those core features exactly the same across different schools and different settings. Now, one of the things that uh, Dean Lee wanted to make clear, right, this is a presentation on evidence-based practice. So here's the evidence, and I'm sure each of you are going to go home tonight, read each of these. One of the things I'm very proud of is several of these actually use hierarchical linear modeling, which Dean Lee is very familiar with. But essentially, for those of you who aren't going to quite have enough time to get through the stats, here's the summary. If you implement school-wide positive behavior support with fidelity, you get a 20 to 60 percent reduction in office discipline referrals. You do it for three years, and you'll actually get an increase in the proportion of kids who meet state standardized test scores for math and reading you'll actually get an increase in the likelihood that students attend school and attend class. Those of you who are in high schools, we've just uh, had a new study that was a randomized controlled trial that was published, focus on the impact of PBIS on attendance, especially attendance for those kids at greatest risk. Schools are perceived as safer places, lower rates of bullying, higher rates of organizational structure. For those of you who are administrators, if you implement PBIS, it decreases the likelihood you'll have staff turnover, which is one of the hidden major expenses in education. It increases the sense of teacher efficacy, and one of the great things is it's not just building this sense of community, it actually is teaching social emotional competence that kids carry forward in a longer time frame. So those are the reasons why I want you to think about PBIS. We currently have, and these are data from January, we currently have over 20,000 schools in the United States that are actively engaged in implementing PBIS. This is the breakout by state. And we know this in part because schools regularly report the extent to which they are implementing, the fidelity of implementation. So these numbers are actually low. Those of you who are trying to count, there's New York, all right? So there are about 500 schools that we can actually identify in New York, that New York State, that are systematically implementing, many of them actually in the city because we've had a, a larger emphasis there. Some of you know that New York State actively supported implementation of PBIS for several years and then faded out that support. This is by proportion of schools. So there are about 10% uh, of the schools in New York have been actively engaged in implementing PBIS. Now, whether you're interested in behavior or academics or social engagement, here are things that we've learned about taking a practice and getting it in place. So I want to talk about these features, and I'm going to go fairly quickly and then come back to the extent to which these fit with your experience. So one of the things I'm going to recommend, I'm going to recommend moving away from packaged programs and towards an emphasis on core features of environments. Education is about creating an effective environment. What are the core features? And let's celebrate that there can be many packages and ways of doing that. And I'm going to show you why that's important in just a minute. The next is, from now on, anyone who claims that they are implementing a new literacy or math or behavioral intervention, always ask, to what extent have you implemented it with fidelity, and how do you measure if you've done that? There should be, from now on, 
two questions that every building administrator is able to answer. One is, are we doing what we said we would do? Second, is it benefiting students? And the data systems are now available to make that very, very cheap, easy, and accurate to do. Anytime you implement something, one of the things we've learned is it's good to stop and say, what are the kinds of mistakes that people might make and actually anticipate those? We didn't do that, and as a function, we were pulled back over and over again. I want you to look at building greater efficiency, building capacity at the beginning, and one of the big themes that you're going to hear in education more and more is how do you actually put things in place that last? So if you, if you are in a school or a district that adopts PBIS, how long do we expect at a minimum you're going to keep doing it? Ten years, all right? Ten years is a long time. The half-life for educational innovations is less than nine months. So I want you to, if, this means we've got to do things a little bit differently. All right, so let's start. Core features. I want you to think about valued outcomes. So what do you really value about schools? What do you value about what children learn and take away? The sense of community, the sense of self-regulation, the sense of control, the sense of academic excellence, the behavioral math, reading, writing, the ability to communicate. What do you value? Then I want you to think about the core features of an environment that actually supports those outcomes. Those core features are critical. Here's what we've learned. Most of the time what people do is they come up with a program or package, the procedure for achieving that core feature. See the purple part or what's, yes, purple. The purple part creates the green core features. Now, here's essentially what we've learned. That works great in community A, but then you go to a second community, and that community is much more uh, populated with people from Native American backgrounds, or much more populated from people with a greater diversity of linguistic experience. And the strategy that worked here isn't quite as well at producing those core features as a different strategy. And then you can do another one, and you can do another one, and it's not that you have to do all of those packages but you do need to pick a package that fits your context. And you do need to separate the package from the core feature that it generates. Too often what legislators and educational administrators demand is that we adopt a package, not that we focus on the core features. The real difference for doing that is, I want you to think about this. Defining what the outcomes are, those are your values. What do you really think is important? I mean, why do we have education? What is the role of education in a democracy? The actual core features are science. How do people learn? What are the fundamental elements, the kernels of knowledge that drive acquisition of skill, knowledge, and competence? I would argue that selecting the package is technology. It's the how do we get this to happen, not how does it happen? And separating those out is incredibly helpful. Part of what it does is it means that rather than certifying packages, you certify core features. So for example, in PBIS, we continually are asked, can I take a training and become a certified PBIS trainer? And the answer is, no, you can't. And then you say, well, how do I, how do I become a PBIS trainer? And the answer is, sweetie, Work with schools and demonstrate that you can move them from point A to fidelity and you are a PBIS trainer. And we can give you 38 different ways to do it and we'll give it to you for free. You can download it off the website, you can look at other schools that are similar, but it's your job to map the context and the culture that you're working in and figure out the most efficient strategy for getting people to those core features from that environment. So we don't certify curricula, we don't certify trainers, we don't certify training regimens. What we certify are core features, and we give people both careful ways in which they can measure if they're doing it, and multiple ways that other people have done it. All right, in terms of, of fidelity, I really want you to come back to this. I mean, this, this sounds like, oh, you know, in education, we're so bludgeoned with data 
one of the real struggles is, I want you to take back data. I want you to stop building data systems and build decision systems. If you're going to implement PBIS so that it lasts for a decade, it needs to continually improve. The only way you're going to continually improve it is by saying, what are we doing and what is working? So you need to be able to keep coming back to, are we putting these things in place? So part of what we've done is we've actually built multiple data systems that allow people to go online for free and assess the extent to which they're implementing PBIS. These are data from schools in Iowa. And the blue bar is the extent to which they are implementing the core features of tier one PBIS. So here's school number four. So you can see they started off at about 12%, then they got up to about 41%. Now, here's what I want you to keep thinking. Too often in education, we get up to about 40%, we say, break out the chocolate and coffee, and we sit back and say, boy, that was pretty good, that was really hard, but we're gonna go home now, right? Here's what I can tell you. If you like the outcomes that are associated with PBIS, you only get those if you implement with a, limited, with a minimum of 80% fidelity. So that's what led these people to here and then to there. And part of what you can see, the reason I'm putting up multiple schools, they didn't go at the same rate. They went at different rates depending on what they already had in place, the support they got from their district, the extent to which the, it fit with their professional development schedule, and that's all okay. In fact, part of what you want to do, never stop doing what already works, always look for the smallest change that'll produce the biggest effect, and never introduce something new unless you define what you're going to stop doing to create the resources to make that happen. Here are schools in California. So take a look at the green part. So one of the things you can do with PBIS is you can break out and you can say, do we have the classroom systems in place? Do we have the consequence system in place? Do we have the reward system? Do we have commitment from the faculty and staff? Do we have a team that's organized? Have we done our self-assessment? Have we defined and taught expectations? Do we have an information system that allows us to make good decisions? And have we built the multi-tiered pieces? So look at the green. Think about being there in the green and you think, oh, golly gee, we are not doing this very well. And you just feel very sad. But your coach says, buck up. This is going to be OK. Let's focus on these two pieces, because those are the first two that we really want to get in place. And then you come back after the blue one and look at the change. Whoa, nice job. So even though there hasn't been much change here and here, that wasn't what we were focusing on, because it's OK. Because as the coach, we're focusing on the smallest change that will produce the biggest effect. You don't have to do everything all at once. It typically takes 12 to 18 months to put PBIS in place with fidelity. All right, You can do it faster, depending on the coaching and support you get from the district. But part of what it does is it gives a guide. And do the fidelity measures, not just for tier one, but for the more intense versions too. One of the things that we've learned, the way that you get implementation is by giving it up. You give people access to fidelity measures that they use, not once a year, but three or four times a year to assess how are we doing, what's the smallest change that we need to make next, how do we put it in place. And that applies not just to the whole school, but this whole notion of assessing fidelity applies to individual student interventions too. Remember the top of the triangle are those interventions that are most, for the most intensely supported kids. These are data that are literally uh, eight days old. So you are looking at stuff that has not been peer reviewed, but it's pretty nifty. So this is what this is. This is a study of three teacher-student dyads, three different schools. So here is a teacher and a student. Here is a teacher and a student. Here is a teacher and a student. And the first, what this study really focuses on is if you use the individual student information system, the ISIS computer data system, a piece of ISIS is that on a regular basis, the teacher says, am I implementing the student's individualized support plan? And 
The process of self-evaluation is incredibly powerful, especially when it's not tied to high-stakes testing, right? But is actually tied to quality improvement. So I want you to look at these little triangles. See this bottom bar? This teacher was implementing the plan at about 20%. When she started implementing with regular self-delivered feedback, look at the change in the plan. This teacher not implementing, implementing. This teacher not implementing, implementing. Now, I know and I've been promised this doesn't happen in New York, but in Oregon, we often build plans that people don't implement very well. No, really. So part of what this shows is it's not that you need to change the plan, it's that you actually need to provide the data system with effective implementation. Now here's the part that is really sweet. Then I want you to look at student problem behavior. Problem behavior, decrease. Problem behavior, decrease. Problem behavior, decrease. How many times have you seen a behavior plan where it was the teacher came back and said, this plan didn't work? Well, the real issue is, cowboy, you only implemented the plan at 38% fidelity. No wonder it didn't work. If you don't use it, it's much less likely to work. So the point is, I want you to come back to this notion of measuring fidelity. The question is, are we doing what we said we would do on a regular basis? I also want you to think about anticipating errors. So part of what we did with, with the multi-tiered system, you say, start with tier one for everybody, add additional support for those who need a little more, add a lot of support for those who need most. The three big messages, invest in prevention first, use multi multiple tiers of support, and invest early. But one of the things we learned is sometimes people thought, well, if I'm doing tier three, we don't have to do tier one. Wrong. So we changed the picture so it shows tier three is inside, tier two is inside tier one. And then people said, oh, come on, the lines are not that solid. We said, sure, you know, you can make the lines between tier two and tier three a little fuzzier. We said, look, you can do the same thing for behavior and for academics. People in Colorado wanted to say, but it's much more dynamic in terms of the way that it works. Some people don't like two dimensions. They wanted to go to three dimensions. George wanted to build something that says, look, you've got behavioral and academic, and they come together to form PBIS. You get the different strategies, the, um, the organizational frameworks. People started getting more expensive PowerPoint slides. They started building variables that worked. And the people in Maryland said, you know, we can actually do it lying down. All right, and we started working more closely with early intervention. They said, oh, your lines are way too harsh. So they wanted to look little fuzzy soft lines, and, but the same basic idea, and then making it dynamic. So if you implement behavioral systems well, they will transform the educational environment and make the academic systems more effective also. Again, our colleagues in mental health wanted to do it upside down because, of course, you know, it's got to be different if you're going to do it that way. Or you don't even have to use triangles. You can use concentric circles. Same basic idea, right? The core features endure. Part of what we also run into over and over again, well, we work only in schools with really tough kids. Listen, I got to tell you, so here, this is a, is a cartoon that says, this is the worst class I've ever had. And she's got everybody piled up against the corner, right? But it's also a triangle. <laughs> and we do PBIS in juvenile justice environments. We do PBIS in, in locked mental health institutions. So you can do this, the same principles. The principles are tied to human behavior, not to anything. And my favorite is this is the lava lamp version that indicates, I don't know if you can see well, but you, that you're not locked in to where you are. The system actually has to be dynamic and work. Those of you who are a little older or a little younger may not get lava lamp was this thing where, thing, anyway, all right. So the other thing is we don't want the triangle to itself become a different labeling system. Never talk about green kids, yellow kids, and red kids. The, the, the triangle is designed to talk about intensity of support. So if, you, if, you've got, if you've got Juan, right, here he is. See them? There he is. And he needs green level supports for reading, yellow level supports for behavior, red level supports for math. He's pretty good with health and personal safety issues. So is he a green kid, a yellow kid, and a red kid? Yes. It's the 
It's the level of intensity. Don't use the triangle to talk about kids. But do identify what are the critical features. So if you're going to do PBIS, not only do you need to be able to define it. What is PBIS? It's a multi-tiered system of building a social culture that increases the effectiveness as a school to build both academic and behavior support for all kids. That'll get you a cookie. All right. Now, in terms of looking at efficiency, part of what we know is if we're going to introduce something, we've got to be able to introduce it in a, well that, a way that actually works well. So in part, efficiency in terms of time, in terms of money, in terms of effort. If you do PBIS well, it should be easier to do the second year than it was the first, easier the third than it was the second. But think about this. One of the things we learned is we learned that problem behavior is expensive. Problem behavior is expensive. And if you just think about the number of hours it takes in administrator time, teacher time, student time, we actually did an analysis in one middle school in Oregon. And when they started implementing PBIS, this was the number of office discipline referrals. When they got it in place, they got PBIS in place with fidelity about here. So you see the reduction in major office discipline referrals. But here's what I really want you to focus on. That change transformed into a saving of 29 eight-hour administrator days. So if you're an administrator looking at adopting PBIS, I want you to worry. What are you going to do with all that extra time? Right? But the other thing, 121 full academic days for kids. Full academic days. So in part, focusing on efficiency and fidelity, really important. Now, at least 12 of you that I can tell are actually also knowledgeable about function-based support. And you're interested in how to do functional, functional analysis and functional behavioral assessments. Well, one of the things that Kathleen Strickland Cohen has taught us is that we can actually teach people to do basic FBAs. And those FBAs can be used with effectiveness in schools. You don't always have to hire a BCBA um, trained, highly skilled clinician. Many behavioral interventions, in fact about 80% of them, are fairly straightforward. Now here's what this graph shows. This is a teacher in a school, teacher in a school, teacher in a school, teacher in a school, so four different teachers, and in each case these dots indicate if the teacher was implementing the behavior support plan that she developed based on a local use of FBA. Not bringing in somebody from the outside, but actually teaching basic FBA skills. This is the extent to which you get change in behavior. Change in behavior, change in behavior, change in behavior, change in behavior. So part of what this shows is that teachers working with teams were able to implement FBA well with basic, simple interventions. The thing I want you also to focus on is, see this point? This is, at this point, that teacher was hired away, and a, um, a university graduate student, or university teacher in training came into the classroom. And that teacher did not believe in the delivery of rewards, because she thought that that uh, infringed on the intrinsic motivation of the student. So look at the extent to which the plan was implemented with fidelity. See the drop? Look at the extent to which the child's problem behavior increased. At that point, we actually terminated the study for the benefit of the child, and we actually went back and re-intervened. Here's the point. The point is coming back to this whole notion of building things with efficiency. Second to last message, never implement a strategy in schools without building the organizational systems that allow them to, to endure. And in most cases, what that means is implementing things in district level support. So over and over again, when we go into districts, we would go into a district and they would establish a leadership team. And what everybody loves to do is they say, let's go straight and build schools that implement PBIS. That's fine. You always are going to implement example schools. But part of what we've learned is that's not enough. The leadership team needs to provide the funding, the visibility, the political support, and the policies to make it work. The leadership team also, and this is the stuff to write down, those of you who want to do implementation science, focus on this. 
to what extent does the district build the training capacity so you don't have to hire people from Illinois? You actually have people local because you don't do training once, you do it regularly. You never train unless you also provide coaching because coaching doubles the likelihood that what you train will be implemented. You never do that unless you also have the actual behavioral expertise that allows you to get to tier two and tier three. And within PBIS, if you are not regularly assessing, are we doing what we said we would do and is it benefiting kids, you are not implementing the program. So in New York, if somebody says, we're implementing PBIS, I want you to say, that's great. What's your fidelity score? What's your team checklist score, your set score, your, your uh, benchmark of quality score? And if people say, well, we don't do that, you say, listen, I actually was at the presentation. If you're not measuring fidelity, you're not doing PBIS. You're not going to be able to put things in place. And we have actually demonstrated that we can show change, we can make those things happen. The other thing I want you to worry about at a district level, and New York is experiencing this already. You've got districts that have implemented PBIS, but then something else will come up, right? And it's, well, we did PBIS two years ago, so now we're gonna do Common Core, or Restorative Justice, or Dignity for All, or Early Literacy, or, I mean, my goodness, here we are in New York, the Annual Professional Performance Review, right? Or Social Emotional Learning. We love in education to continually chase the new idea, always giving up the old without actually having done it with fidelity or s with sustained effects. So here's part of what we're learning. Education should continually improve, but how do you align programs? How do you find ways where you can take the best of different innovations and initiatives? And in part, it keeps coming back to that whole notion of the core features. What we're saying, Focus on the outcomes of kids. Define the core features that are similar across innovations. Use your existing strengths. Never stop doing what already works. Build things focused on a common set of outcomes. Are we implementing the core features? Is it benefiting students? And you will, in fact, be able to meet and meld competing and conflicting initiatives. So part of what we're really learning is we can put those things in place in ways that actually are much more compatible than we've had in the past. The last big message that I bring is this need to focus on sustainability. <clears throat> the best way you focus on sustainability is by building capacity right from the beginning. But you've got to worry. Most educational innovations don't last beyond nine months. The likelihood that things sustain is not due to whether they work. It has to do with whether they're implemented with the systems that allow them to achieve. So we've been doing research the past little bit looking at sustainability. Let me just share a little bit. Um, Jennifer Coffey published a paper looking at 285 schools. And she asked two questions. What actually predicts if they initially adopt PBIS and how does that compare with if they sustain PBIS? And so we looked at of the schools, how many met the fidelity criterion? Remember, what's the criterion? 80%, all right? And we compared those with the schools that did not. We looked at the core features of PBIS and we said, using good statistics, what's the best, what best predicts the likelihood that schools will actually implement with fidelity? And the two things that came across as strongest, if the schools taught the behavioral expectations and they actually built the data system that gave them fidelity and outcome information, they were statistically significantly more likely to get to criterion, all right? So that's cute, that's nice. But then she asked a second question, which was, what about sustaining? And if they met criteria, what made the biggest difference to sustain was one, whether they had a formal acknowledgement system. All right, come on, you've been in schools. You know that kids think, they don't give us many degrees of freedom, all right? They really, they are careful and they're a little bit uh, cynical. If we teach them something and we don't come back and, and build the rewards and follow through, then they think they didn't really mean it. So if you actually have a systematic reward system, that comes back and says, look, we really are serious the reward system and the consequence system. 
But we also found that the real critical thing for sustainability was with the building administrator. And you know the role that administrators play. So we did a further analysis looking at the contextual features that predicted the most likely variables that affect sustained um, sustaining PBIS. So the school administrator, whether they identified PBIS as one of the top three goals, whether they had regular meetings, whether they were organized and operated efficiently. And from this, we essentially have built a, a paper organizing around what are the variables that administrators control, not just to get something in place, but to sustain it. The reason we think this is important, and we published this paper in Teaching Exceptional Children, is because it doesn't just rely it doesn't just refer to PBIS, it also refers to issues related to math, to reading, and to uh, writing and other variables. In education, we continually focus far too much on what's the sexy new thing, not what are the core features of school environments that best benefit kids and their families, and to what extent can we get those in place in ways that work. So in sum, here's my message, all right? So I've been doing this for 35 years. Here's what I would say. I think education is right now on the verge of being influenced by three big things that for those of you who are graduate students could easily affect your research careers. Each one of these has dissertations written all over it, okay? But it also has big impact for the way in which the federal government is going to be funding education, the way that school boards should be acknowledging and pushing educational reform, and definitely what we who are in administrative and teaching and support roles should be doing. One is a strong commitment to using practices that are truly evidence-based. Second is recognizing that not just with PBIS, but with every strategy that we adopt, we should expect multiple tiers of support. Third is this whole notion of saying, we need to pay much greater attention to the variables that affect if we implement, not how do we, uh, how do we select. The things that we've learned about how you do this, not just with two, three, or four schools, but how you do it with tens of thousands, basically is this, focus on core features not the packages. Always give people the self-assessment power to, um, to determine fidelity. Anticipate errors and organize so that you respond quickly if they do occur. Focus on efficiency because things that are effective will not sustain unless they are efficient. And if you're gonna put something in place, efficiency should increase from year one to year two and from year two to year three. If you're going to build things that sustain, focus first and foremost on building capacity of the system. And what that means for me is coming back to this real key message. If you want individual classrooms to be effective, build the, the strategies that a teacher uses in that classroom, but with the systems that the whole school uses and the support structure that they will need from the district. Reform in education will come from the school district most. It gets implemented in schools and classrooms, and only in that way will it benefit children and families. All right, you've been very kind to take a afternoon on a beautiful day and come inside a closed theater. And uh, I sincerely appreciate the, the time and the interest. Um, let's stop and have questions, so thank you.